This is no ordinary NVIDIA workstation graphics card. This is the GTX 970's Redemption. With nothing more than some BIOS modding tools and a fresh coat of thermal paste, I was able to reform this mid-range Quadro into a fully capable gaming graphics card, featuring not 3.5GB, but 8GB of GDDR5 VRAM and the same performance as the GTX 970. Uh, well, almost. In case that intro made no sense to you whatsoever, here's a really fast summary. In 2014, Nvidia released the GTX 970, a $329 mid-range graphics card with a killer feature set. It offered previous gen flagship performance and a gigabyte more VRAM, as well as DX12 and Vulkan feature support that make it surprisingly relevant even today. Alas, it was too good to be true. After some digging around, the community discovered that only 3.5GB of the 4 gigs on board was actual full-speed GDDR5, with the remaining half gigabyte of slower 32-bit RAM rarely being used in-game. Although a bunch of disgruntled consumers successfully sued Nvidia and scored a $30 refund for anyone who bought the card, this doesn't change the fact that the GTX 970 still only has less than 4GB on board and that could put some people off what would otherwise be a pretty compelling budget GPU on the 2022 second-hand market. Now, not to completely write off the 970, I reviewed it a few months ago and found that it holds up pretty well in modern titles. The Quadro M4000 looks like a good candidate to fix the 970's fatal flaw. Based on the same GM204 GPU, with 1664 CUDA cores, the only things holding the Quadro back were clock speeds and power delivery. Whereas the 970 runs that same GPU between 1050 and 1178 MHz, and can go dramatically higher if the power and thermals will allow it, the M4000 has a base clock of 773 MHz and... Uh, that's it. No boost clock to speak of. The RAM too runs slower at 3000 mega transfers a second instead of 3500. Of course, no worries, you might say, knowing full well that Maxwell is known for its overclocking prowess. Just load up MSI Afterburner and drag some sliders till you're back up to the 970's baseline spec. Hell, with some tweaks you might even get an undervolt or an overclock. Maybe even both. <laughs> well, hold on a sec, der Bauer. There's a flaw in that hypothesis. Nvidia locks their Quadro cards down pretty tightly, so no third-party software I'm aware of can control the GPU beyond applying a custom fan curve. To increase the M4000's performance to gaming grade, I'd need to modify the BIOS. Uh, just a quick disclaimer, um, I, I don't really know what I'm doing. I'm far from an expert, and you probably shouldn't copy what I did here or ask for my advice on how to do this kind of mod. I've provided links to the tools and guides I use down below, and I'll happily share the settings that worked for me, but I can't really offer technical support, and I also can't guarantee that my method was the best. It might be worth checking the comments and see if anyone's posted a better alternative method, or more likely has just torn me to shreds. The main tool needed is Maxwell BIOS Editor, which starts off fairly self-explanatory, but quickly goes downhill after the first tab. Although I'd read some guides about what everything meant, I figured a good start would be to open a second window of the editor, containing a stock GTX 970 BIOS, and simply copy over as many of the values as possible. After using the modded version of NV Flash included with the editor, this part's important as regular versions of NV Flash won't allow you to flash a modded BIOS to the card, I restarted the computer and ran some tests. Things started fine, until they weren't. I ran the MSI Combustor Stress Test, and although the boost clock didn't seem to be working, I was at least breaking past the gigahertz mark on the core. Power limits were reaching about 120 watts, and temps were climbing, but not dangerously so. On trying to launch Time Spy, however, the screen turned brown before quitting out completely and leaving me with a score of zero. Further attempts caused the PC to completely shit itself and do a hard reboot each time, likewise when I attempted to run God of War and Final Fantasy VII. 
After reading up on what more of the tools in MBE actually did, I figured that I could probably get things stable with a little more power. Changing the power table, alas, did pretty much nothing good. The card has a base TDP of 120 watts compared to the 148 watts of the GTX 970. Even increasing that TDP by 10 watts resulted in an instant driver crash as soon it was asked to render something in 3D. In theory, the card should be able to draw 150 watts, 75 from the PCIe slot and 75 from the 6-pin cable, but according to GPU-Z, no matter what I did, the slot wasn't drawing more than about 40 watts. Reluctant to exceed the 75 watt limit and potentially fry the motherboard, I decided to accept the 120 watt limit and just revise my expectations. I wasn't going to get a full GTX 970 experience from this hardware without more knowledge and skill than I actually have. So this time I started from scratch with the M4000 BIOS, increased the base clock to a more conservative 1000 MHz and the boost clock to 1100. I also increased the values in the voltage table a little. In my initial failed tests, the GPU had been running at a peak of 975 millivolts, and after some tweaking, I only managed to round that up to an even 1 volt. But it was enough. After a couple of hours of tinkering, it was done. I'd managed to get the Quadro M4000 to run at a core clock of around 1080 megahertz, a RAM clock of 3500, and all while using a little less than 120 watts of power. Obviously I never had any doubts I'd succeed, and didn't give up halfway through, draft a script where I'd failed, and test everything at stock speeds. However, if I had done that, I'd have a full set of benchmarks at stock clocks to compare it to. At stock clocks, the Quadro M4000 can't reach a playable frame rate in God of War without resorting to FSR. At 1080 original, frames averaged about 26 FPS and dipped as low as 22, making it about half the performance of the consumer card. Adding FSR 2.0 at the performance setting brings things closer to a more playable 30 FPS, but even being able to enable maximum quality textures and shadows doesn't make up for this lower render resolution. With the BIOS mod, things are a lot more palatable. The average at 1080 jumps to 35 FPS and lows hit 28. FSR performance this time pushes the average to the mid 40s and lows well above 30, though you might want to use a less heavy handed scaling option as things are looking a bit gritty in motion. At first glance, it seems that Final Fantasy VII Remake didn't gain much performance from the overclock and I kind of didn't expect it to, but I did expect an increase in quality, and I didn't get that either. The game's dynamic scaler means that sometimes extra GPU power is used to keep the render resolution higher rather than give extra FPS, but in this case it seems that image quality is about the same. There was, however, a substantial improvement in 1% lows. I counted a 10% jump in averages from 60 to 66 FPS, but a huge jump at the low end from 35 FPS to 56. Elden Ring also sees a very respectable jump in performance from the mod. At stock speeds, 1080 max settings isn't quite reaching 30 FPS, and while maybe some games would allow you to tolerate a bit of lag, this isn't one of them. With the overclock, minimums scrape over 30 FPS and averages reach about 36. Dropping to the medium preset would normally result in some horrible, glitchy looking shadows, especially around trees, but thanks to the 8GB frame buffer, it's possible to keep shadow and texture resolution at max values without much of a hit to performance. What's more, the modded M4000 can now reach over 45 FPS. Which, coincidentally, it can also do for Forza Horizon 5. Without overclocking, the M4000 is only good for 35 FPS at 1080 high in the canned benchmark. Adding FSR quality takes the minimum up above the 30 FPS mark and almost hits 40 on average. With the overclock, however, this jumps to over 47 FPS at full 1080 and 53 FPS with FSR. I was honestly a little disappointed that FSR didn't help out more. I thought maybe it would have reached 60, but dropping from high to medium would probably help if you wanted to reach a 60 FPS target. I only got round to testing Halo Infinite in single player. I know, I know, I'm slacking off. 
but in my defense I was running most of these benchmarks on the hottest day the UK has ever experienced and although my flat is in the shade of some trees like most Brits I don't have AC and it was getting pretty uncomfortable. Still my single player test is in an open world section of gameplay and usually comes pretty close to what you can expect to see in big team battles. Smaller scale skirmishes will see higher FPS than this, which at least for the stock M4000 is probably just as well. At 1080 low without dynamic resolution, the game falls short of a 30 FPS average. This is yet another occasion where I think turning on DRS with a 30 minimum would be advisable. As for the overclock, while it doesn't work miracles, it does gain a whopping 10 FPS on both the average and 1% lows. I'd say you could get away with skipping DRS, but if you wanted you could probably enable a 60fps minimum, although image quality would, of course, suffer a lot. Cyberpunk takes a lot of inspiration from classic genre movies of the 1980s and 90s, so it's utterly appropriate that at 1080 medium settings, the stock M4000 managed a cinematic 24fps on average. You can tell when a GPU isn't performing up to standard, as the game takes pity on you and decides not to draw as much traffic or as many pedestrians as it normally would. Turning on quality FSR sees a bump in frame rates to 35. With the BIOS mod, things are much better. The card can manage a 30 FPS average at native 1080, and enabling FSR brings the minimum up to 30 and the average to 45. The stock M4000 can get into 6 extraction at 60fps, but only by sacrificing some resolution. 1080 high with 50% scaling should do the trick, which in Ubisoft language means a render resolution of about 1360 by 765 Full unfettered 1080 high reaches about 40fps, and in my previous testing I found that dropping from high actually doesn't affect fps all that much. With the BIOS mod, things get a lot more interesting. Native 1080 high is close to a 60 FPS average, and dropping render resolution to 50% brings that up to 84, and minimums over 60. Splitgate performance varies a lot depending on the map, but after averaging out three runs in each setup, I found that the base M4000 can manage an average close to 120 FPS without modding. This is probably good enough for most people, and you might not want to risk bricking a graphics card to get some meaningless increases to numbers you don't even see while playing, but eh, this isn't a practical guide, is it? With the overclock applied, that average jumped to almost 160 FPS, and minimums just over 100. Unfortunately, Call of Duty Vanguard isn't an ideal match for this card, overclocked or not. Not that 51 FPS is unplayable, for casual players like myself it totally is, but it's still not ideal. At 1080 low the game's fairly presentable, and turning up shadows and textures doesn't hurt either the appearance or the frame rate. For me, though, some maps just devolve into a bit of a muddy mess at these settings, and having to enable FSR only makes visibility even worse. FSR quality can get above 70 FPS on average and bring minimums into the 50s, but I find the lower render resolution combined with a lot of enemies in earth-coloured fatigues on earth-coloured landscapes makes identifying exactly who or what's shooting at me a bit of a nightmare. Fortnite thankfully doesn't present that problem at all. Even at the lowest settings with epic view distance, enemy visibility is excellent, and the M4000 can manage a greater than 100 FPS experience with or without overclocking. The margin between the two, however, is pretty stark. At stock speeds, the card manages an average 111 FPS with lows just over 70, but with the overclock, you're looking at enough power to drive a high refresh monitor, averaging almost 148 FPS and with minimums a shade below 100. Likewise, Apex Legends sees a pretty seismic jump in performance thanks to the mod. The stock experience is fine, averaging 75 FPS at 1080 low with 8GB textures and TAA enabled. In fact, it's more than fine, you could run this all day. However, the OC takes things up a notch, averaging a mighty 99 FPS and with lows above 60. I still kinda hate the game, but that's not the GPU's fault. 
Warzone fared a little better than Vanguard, especially with the overclock. The roughly 300 MHz increase to core clocks and 500 on the memory sees average FPS at 1080 low increase from just over 40 FPS to just below 60, with 1% lows actually better than the average of the stock results. Dropping resolution has about the same effect as it does in Vanguard, at least to visibility. In return, the stock card will get you about 10% short of a 60 FPS experience. Whereas the overclock can not only reach 75 FPS, it could conceivably run with a 60 lock and only occasional dips into the 50s. All things considered, this was a pretty successful project, right? For a little bit of time and effort and a fairly cavalier attitude towards potentially bricking a GPU that cost me over 100 quid, it seems like it was all worthwhile. Well, yes and no. Although everything was stable once I'd found the right settings, there was a weird audio glitch. It probably won't affect all people, but I run a pair of passive bookshelf speakers off a combination amp DAC, which is effectively working like a USB sound card, and it would frequently cut out in a weird way. Running headphones off the front panel presented no such issues, so as I said, not really an issue for most people, but it was a pain in the ass for me. Also, I guess I should address the question, did I really turn this single slot quadro into an 8 GB GTX 970? Again, yes and no. If you're comparing to a shitty bargain basement model of 970 with rubbish cooling, this score is probably within 10% or so. In my review earlier this year, however, I wasn't using a shitty model with a blower cooler. I was using an MSI gaming card with superb cooling and GPU boost for days. It averaged in the high 1300s on the core, and as a result it scored a hell of a lot higher than the modded M4000 does. Granted, on a few occasions I did feel able to turn up texture and shadow res on the 8GB card, but that probably isn't worth the extra time, effort, risk and cost. Uh, yes, I, I didn't really mention the cost, did I? When I bought this card in March, it cost me £150, and these days you can expect to pay more like £120 to £130 on eBay, or possibly less if you have the patience to bid on an auction. A GTX 970, even a decent quality one, was significantly cheaper even by the time I bought my card, and should cost less than £100 today. Given that some games need resolution drops and upscaling to reach playable FPS on the GTX 970 these days, I don't think ultra quality textures and shadow maps are going to have quite the impact you might hope for. It was a fun experiment, and I think there's possibly some room for someone more skilled than I to take this to the next level. With more power and maybe some custom cooling, I could see this at least matching a reference 970, maybe even a decent partner model. I'm looking forward to the comments, I'd like to know if anyone has any suggestions for how I could improve my mod or if there's any obvious stuff that I missed. If you'd like to help me buy and potentially brick moderately obscure graphics cards like this one, you can donate using the super thanks button below or on my Patreon, linked on screen now. Thanks for watching, kindly do the usual YouTube things if you feel so inclined, and I'll see you next time.